think I'm getting old. <laughs> I, I had to bring three notes up here, and I'm, and I'm not sure I'll remember everything I was supposed to say anyhow. Uh, one note, one thought just came to me as we were singing. Uh, we sang, here I raise my what? Ebenezer. What, what does Ebenezer mean? A rock. Uh, actually, it's a rock of help. The reason I uh, announced or s said anything about that this morning is next week my title is A Rock Concert. <laughs> now, I'm not going to give you any advance notice of what's that about. You'll have to come and find out. But I would encourage you to read next Sunday's Daily Bread before you come. And uh, that, that, that'll factor into our, my message next week. And then some of you know Marjorie, or knew Marjorie Arvan. She passed away two days ago. And uh, we're gonna have a memorial service for her on the 29th of April here in the church. But her daughter wanted us to let you know that, that she is home with the Lord at, at this time. The third thing that we have is uh, Brett and Anna and James and Oliver have come all the way from Austria to share with us today. And I'm going to ask you to come forward at this time and you can grab one of these two mics. I, I've already asked permission, so <laughs> you, you can use them. And the way up. Can you hear me now? Good. Good. <laughs> good. Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you uh, this morning. And yeah, it's true. We did come all the way from Austria and we'll get to that, but it was maybe not by choice at this uh, at this point, <clears throat> but we'll get to that. Uh, we came from Ellensburg. We came from Ellensburg this morning. Uh, we are Brett, Anna, James, and Oliver Rexinger. We are missionaries working in partnership with your church to help mobilize the people in Austria for Jesus. Your prayer support and financial partnership have allowed us to be a presence, a gospel presence in a post-Christian culture. So a culture which feels that they have evolved past the need for Christianity. And in last September, we officially launched to Austria as long-term missionaries with Reach Global, which is the world missions branch of the EFCA, or the Evangelical Free Church of America. We had our lives packed up into 10 suitcases as we moved to Europe. We said many hard goodbyes. We'll see how long the kids stay up here with us as well. Uh, we said many hard goodbyes not knowing when we would see people again face to face. Uh, but mixed in with all the hard emotions, there was also joy, excitement, anticipation of what was to come. A dream, a calling from the Lord was being realized and we praised him who had done it all. So you might be surprised to see us back here. September is not very long ago for long-term missions. Uh, we're kind of surprised to be here too. We are currently back in Washington to reapply for our visa. So we originally applied for our visa in Austria, but our application and our appeal was denied. Um, to give you a little background, upon our arrival into a new country, as Europe specifically, a person has a period of three months or 90 days to apply for a residency visa. So after gathering all our documents, and we waited for Anna's original birth certificate to come from the United States, um, and according to the tracker, it hung out in Jamaica for just a, a bit, um, we went to the visa office to apply a month early, or so we thought. We were then told that we had stayed past our 90-day limit by three days. We discovered that the time we spent in Austria over the summer for English camp counted towards that 90-day period. So even though we left the country, traveled to Budapest, Hungary for one week, and then returned to the States for another five weeks, the time still counted towards that 90 days. So they look at a six-month period and how long you've stayed in um, Europe within those six months. 
Uh, so we were asked very kindly to leave the country and uh, reapply for our visa from here. So we are currently waiting to receive my New York birth certificate with an apostilla. If you don't know what that is, you are among most everyone in the room. Uh, an apostilla is a legal verification that shows your certificate is internationally recognized. And so we've already received Washington's um, marriage and birth certificates for Anna, the kids, our marriage certificate, things like that. Washington was very easy to work with. New York has not been <laughs> as, as easy. But once we have received my certificate with the apostilla, we will be able to schedule an appointment with the Austrian consulate in LA, where we will be reapplying for our visa in person. And once we apply, it can take anywhere between two weeks, which is best case scenario, to six months to hear back. But the usual amount of wait time we've heard is about two months. So as we wait, we are grateful to be here today with you all. Pass this off. Maybe we'll try and exchange kids. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so we know that the Lord has purpose in this time of waiting, and uh, we really don't want to miss it. Uh, one thing that we've noticed that the Lord has been doing in our own hearts is he's teaching us to be watchful for him and to trust, uh, even if we don't understand what he's doing. Uh, so one of my favorite Christian writers, Jerry Bridges, wrote an incredible book on, or called Trusting God, uh, which is essentially a Bible study on the sovereignty of God. And in it, he examines the book of Esther as an example of God's sovereign control over specific events. So Bridges writes, Undoubtedly, one of the reasons the book of Esther is included in Scripture is to help us see the sovereign hand of God at work behind the scenes. And then Bridges goes on to note that one of the most arresting things about the book is that the name of God is never once mentioned. Yet the observant reader sees God's hand in every circumstance. We know that God, um, that God was as sovereignly at work through ordinary circumstances in the time of Esther, uh, just as he continues to be today. Um, and we all know the outcome of the book of Esther. We know that God used Esther and her uncle Mordecai to save the nation of Israel from destruction. Although it is possible for a person to read Esther and miss the sovereign hand of God, um, which orchestrated details, which turned the heart of the king to do his will, and which precisely lined up events to accomplish his purposes. But as believers, we don't want to miss what God is doing behind the scenes. And our family doesn't want to miss what God is doing. So our visa situation might be um, frustrating. It might feel like a mistake or a bad coincidence of timing. It might feel like we're victims of circumstance um, because of an unknown technicality. But we are choosing to see the great storyteller behind the events. Uh, and we aren't sure what story he's telling yet, uh, but we trust him, and we really want what he wants. Um, so to quote our friend Jerry Bridges again on the book of Esther, he writes, God was sovereignly orchestrating the events of that night to save his people. The question naturally arises, however, does God always orchestrate the events of my life for my good? And according to Romans 8.28, the answer is a solid yes. That verse says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And there is so much peace and joy for us in knowing that God is sovereign and that he is working out things for good and more importantly for his glory. Because it's really not so much about us as it is about him. His plan, his heart for the people of Austria, his glory and his way of salvation. do the switch again. So we'll tell you a little bit about our time in Austria. So it feels like we lived in Austria for longer than just four months. Uh, we dug down deep with a long-term mentality, and so we kind of laugh about it, but for the first time in 10 years of marriage, we even bought a mop. And so um, in a small way, I know, in a small way, that was an intentional way in which we made Austria our home. Uh, but we've really just begun. During our time in Austria, one sec, here we go. The chapstick lid, very important. Okay. <laughs> During our time in Austria, we were excited and grateful to envision a long term future in ministry for our family. So uh, we will wait on his timing and as he leads. In Jeremiah 29, a letter is recorded where the prophet writes to the Jewish people who have been exiled to Babylon. Uh, the Lord extorted the exiles to build homes and plan to stay, plant gardens and eat the food they produce, marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, 
and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. And that's Jeremiah 29, 5 through 11. So we love the long-term mentality of this verse and the intentional and purposeful investment that the Jewish people were encouraged to have in their new city. And although we weren't sent into exile, um, this is something that we are excited and motivated to do as well. One of our primary tasks uh, our first year on the field is language learning. So I'm not gonna uh, try and butcher the German language uh, to you up front, um, but if you want, I can in the back. <laughs> Even though, even though English is widely spoken, uh, especially by the younger generation, we really feel that learning the language is an essential part of understanding a culture. It is said that uh, language is a roadmap to culture. They're so closely linked and it speaks volumes to people around us when, you, when they know that you are investing time in studying their heart language. So our German classes have already opened up relationships with our neighbors as they encourage us in our language learning and, sh and share more of their culture and identity with us. Uh, we've been enrolled in class classes since October and we are making steady progress. We are a couple weeks into our B11 class, which is the fifth level of our program. We are grateful that we are able to continue with these classes online even while back in the States. Uh, that means we are able to continue working on our primary task uh, for our first year as vocational missionaries, which feels good. Uh, we do have to say that learning a new language is very humbling. It's very difficult. And so we appreciate your prayers and your continued prayer in that. But our role as missionaries in Austria is to kind of stand in the gap. We stand in the gap between the world and the church making an appeal. So our mission is to share, share Christ and to draw the world around us into a local church but it's also to draw that local church out into out of our four walls and engage with the world around. But one of the serious spiritual needs of Austria, which deeply stirs our hearts, is the lack of Christian churches. After centuries of political and religious conflicts, Austria is this spiritual vacuum waiting to be filled. And Catholic church attendance has been steeply declining for decades, and Islam is now the fastest growing religion while only 0.4% of the population is part of a Bible-believing church. Europe has a strong religious history, but the culture has stepped away from those roots and is in darkness and ruin right now. So the health and presence of the local church, the body of Christ, is what our team and what our hearts are all about. It is through the power of Christ that the church will transform entire neighborhoods, cities, and countries. Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So during our time in Innsbruck, we took seriously the commitment to a local body of believers. Uh, there are a handful of Protestant churches and literally a handful, I think just, just maybe five, <laughs> of Protestant churches in Innsbruck, which is a city of about 132,000 people. Our missionary team of 10 adults are spread out across the city and together we represent four local church communities. And we attend, uh, I said I wasn't gonna butcher it, but I, I am, we attend a small church called Frei Evangelica Gemeinde. We work in partnership with our team and churches to strengthen and revitalize churches in our city, extend gospel ministries to the lost and to multiply disciple makers. In addition to learning German, a large part of our initial focus in Austria has been building uh, evangel, I always struggle with this word. Evangelistic. evangelistic. I always want to say evangelistic. Wait, that's right. <laughs> we'll just, uh, let's act like that never happened. We've spent a lot of time cultivating relationships with the staff. <laughs> with the staff. Hmm. <clears throat> Okay, we've spent a lot of time cultivating relationships with the staff and kids at the Ukrainian orphanage. The spiritual need in Austria has been compounded by a, a challenge of a demographic shift due to a massive refugee and immigrant presence. People have been displaced and unsettled. They are looking for hope and stability. It is a very exciting and strategic time for missionaries to be in Europe. The European 
excuse me, the Ukrainian mm -hmm. orphanage has slowly opened up to us and entrusted us to spend time with their kids inside and outside of the orphanage. Mm -hmm. We initially got to know the kids, a lot of the kids, when they came to our sum summer English camp last year. We've been able to develop those relationships throughout the year uh, through different outreaches and activities, and we look forward to having the kids back at camp again this summer. During our time, uh, during our time there, I got to work with our team's Learn Hilfa program. It's a tutoring program for after-school kids, and to build relationships with students from Egypt, Morocco, Ukraine, Turkey, and Syria, many of whom have that Muslim strong Muslim background. And I got to help them with their math and English. Not some words, apparently, but. <laughs> We've been intentionally building relationships with our Austrian and German neighbors as well, our bank teller, families at the park, and seniors who ride our small village bus. Our neighbors are taking good care of our apartment while we're here. Uh, we've been getting to know the Austrian believers and pastors in our city as we partner together in gospel initiatives. So as new missionaries, um, we're pretty new, uh, we've been blessed to enter into a team whose faithfulness over the past 25 years um, has really produced some amazing fruit, uh, which we know God gets all the glory for. Um, so our team has had the privilege of seeing um, teenagers saved at English camp over the years and grow up to be leaders in their local churches. Um, we've seen Muslim kids come to know Christ through our youth program. Um, and this winter, one of the local churches um, that our team's been investing in has started a new church plant in a neighboring valley. Um, and we've been able to t partner together with local churches um, in gospel initiatives to re reach the lost. Um, and so as we're newly stepping into our role in Austria, we're grateful for the faithful heritage of our team, and we are expectant of what the Lord has in store. He is working, and he is growing his church uh, but he was in Austria long before we, we arrived, and he will remain long after we're gone. Uh, but we are so grateful to partner with you in what God is doing in Europe. Uh, thank you for being a very real part of what is happening and for investing in something eternal. Um, and as we close, we would love to share some specific prayer requests with you um, during this unusual season. Um, so we would appreciate prayer for just a speedy visa process because, um, you know, the, the red tape and jumping through the hoops can just take a while. Um, pray for our uh, relationships back in Austria. Um, and then pray for our boys, James and Oliver, as they are living in two worlds and kind of figuring things out. Um, and then pray that we would just be open to what the Lord has for us during this season. And like we said, we don't want to miss what the Lord is doing. Um, and then also we would appreciate prayer for German language learning. <laughs> um, but yes, we are so grateful for your uh, faithful partnership. Um, and we also want to let you know that we do have some updated prayer cards in the back. Um, and we have an email newsletter sign up. Um, and we also have money to give you all. Um, but before you rush to the back, it's, it's just two cents. <laughs> um, they're two cent coins from Austria. Um, but now you can have our two cents and a souvenir from Austria. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us, and uh, especially sharing with how we can better pray for you. We, we appreciate that. Uh, there is a plate in the back if you want to help with their ministry. Uh, I think it's back there by the offering box, so uh, feel free to help in, in their work in that way. We're going to turn to Philippians chapter 2 for a few minutes this morning, Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs. Because he was longing for you all, was distressed because of you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I, be let, I may be less concerned about you. Therefore receive him in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, 
risking his life to complete that which was deficient in your service for me. There are many unsung heroes of the faith. We, in one of our songs, sang this morning about the heroes of the faith and the time that we're going to get to share together with them in, in glory. I am well aware that there are many or some big name evangelists, pastors, and so forth out there. And I don't want to diminish their ministry, but I think if, if you could sit down and talk with some of them, you would find out that they give credit to a host of men and women who support them in prayer, in financial giving, and who volunteer in, in their ministries there. Sometimes if we're not careful, we wrestle with wondering, does it really matter what we do? Is our work really important to the, to the Lord? We come today to an unnamed hero, or not unnamed, but a hero of the faith that we know just about nothing about. And, and we'll look at that in just a minute, but as, as you think of your role today, I want you to think of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, where the Apostle Paul said it's a required of a steward or a servant there that one be found faithful. He doesn't call us all to greatness, but he does call us all to faithfulness. And so as he has gifted us and as we use that gift, we can <laughs> make a difference for Jesus Christ. Sometimes we wonder, does it really matter? I can't help but think of Matthew chapter 25. Oh, and I have to apologize. Uh, Ginger's not home. <laughs> so you didn't get the PowerPoint today. And, and even though if she was home, you wouldn't have gotten it anyhow, because I'm not sure what part of my message I'm going to give and what part I'm not going to give today. Uh, we'll, we'll work that out as we go along. But... Uh, I don't have to feel bound by what's up there this, this week anyhow. Uh, in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, it, you have the, the time when Christ separates the sheep from the goats, time of judgment at the end of the world there. And he rewards those who have been faithful. He said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me the drink and so forth. When I was in prison, you visited me. And the amazing thing is, they're standing there before him and they say, Lord, when? When did we do that? They, they weren't even aware of what the, they were doing for, for the glory of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. And so if we touch the life of someone else for the glory of God, we are accomplishing much with our life. Again, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus said, whoever in the name of the disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. We don't think much about sharing a cup of water, do we? Giving somebody a bottle of water. And yet God notices that. And so we come to a hero of the faith, as I said, one that we know very little about. We know his name, it's Epaphroditus, a very common name in those days. Uh, it meant handsome or charming. Uh, I always thought it was great that uh, my parents didn't choose a name like Epaphroditus. <laughs> Can you, you imagine that, trying to remember how to spell that? <laughs> But th that was his name, and that, that was a common name in the Greek culture of the first century there. He was evidently from the city of Philippi. And uh, uh, I'm going to get rid of your music if you don't mind. It's bothering me. <laughs> and you're bent. Uh, there we go. That's much better. Uh, I, I keep looking at your mu music, and I'm thinking I have to sing it. <laughs> That, that, that's not going to work. Uh, had he been born in the city of Philippi, he would have been an officially a Roman citizen because they were granted that right as a, one of the, the colonies of Rome, that they were considered citizens of, of Rome. But you know what? 
That's about all we know about Epaphroditus. Not much to write a biography on. Uh, if, if you're into writing biogra biographies, you don't have a whole lot to work with there because the only time he is mentioned in scripture is in Philippians chapter two that we just read. And in f chapter four, verse 18, we know that he was the one that brought a, a, a gift from the church to the apostle Paul. Beyond that, we have no idea what he did, whose life he touched, where he, he was effective and so forth. But it's important for us to look at what does Paul reveal about this man? What, what does Paul have to say about his, his life and his work and, and ministry? And as we look at that, what is he trying to say to us today? Because not all of us are in positions of greatness, and yet all of us have a great responsibility to fulfill as we walk through this life. As I looked at his life, I noticed three things about his life. First of all, in your notes, he had a balanced life. Why do I say that? I was impressed with the way Paul describes him here. He, he gives three things about Epaphroditus and his life. He first of all mentions that he was a brother. A brother in the Lord now. In other words, he was part of the family of God. He was brought into the family of God through the, the new birth. And that term that he uses here to describe him as a brother goes back to chapter 1, verse 5, where it speaks of, in view of your participation in the, in the gospel from the first day until till now. It speaks of the fact that here was one who was involved in the fellowship of the gospel. The gospel was important to Epaphroditus, it was, and it should be important to each one of us as well. We should recognize that as a child of God, we're a family. We, we have a, a new family that we relate to today. And it's an area that we need. We all need one another. That's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 says in verse 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But he goes on to say, encourage one another. Encourage one another. That's what we are called to do as, as we are part of the family of God. Now, I realize there are times when we need to be encouraged. And there are times when we need to encourage someone else. It, it's a mutual uh, arrangement there. Um, but one of the, the joys of being part of a family is the mutual en encouragement that is there. Uh, we sometimes sing that song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Are you today? Are, are, are you thankful that God has placed you in, in a family? And, and if you have, that's a loaded question. Because the second one here is he was a fellow worker. Being part of the family of God has its privileges, but it also has its responsibilities. Uh, the word fellow worker can also be translated a companion in labor. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul speaks of the fact that we are laborers together with God. God is working in us. God is working through us to touch the hearts and lives of others. As part of a family, we all have responsibilities. Even when our kids were little, they had their chores that they were expected to do, the, the, a role that they played in the family. For a function to function properly, each member must recognize they have a part to play. And if they don't play their part, sometimes things don't get done. And, and uh, he, as, as a fellow worker here, his purpose came out of verse 12 of chapter 1, where it speaks of the circumstances that touched his life. Good verse. You just had some circumstances touch your lives. You're not sure what, what God is doing, but notice what Paul said about it. He said, they've turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Do we always understand that? I don't think so. When things touch our lives, sometimes we wonder 
we question God, what, what, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? But, but the fact remains, we are companions in labor. What he allows to happen to our life, he allows to happen to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all have different gifts. We all have different responsibilities. We all have a part to play in the furtherance of the gospel here in Soap Lake and here in this church. God has placed us here for a reason. We are to communicate the gospel to a community that desperately needs the gospel message. And, and so we are to be fellow workers as well. And then Paul describes him as a fellow soldier or a defender of the faith. Again, I take you back to chapter 1, verse 27, where he speaks of the fact that we are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What part did Epaphroditus play in fighting for the faith of the gospel in Philippi? We have no idea. God doesn't reveal it to us. We don't know, but God does. As I thought about that, I wonder, what part do you play in the furtherance of the gospel here? Now, I know what part some of you play, but I don't know what part all of you play. Now, now, that's between you and, and the Lord there. But I am reminded of a time in the, the life of General Eisenhower. It was during World War II. He was serving as a general, and one of the generals under him referred to a soldier as just a private. He was sternly rebuked by General Eisenhower. He reminded him that the army could function better without its generals than it could without its foot soldiers. He said, if the war is to be won, it will be won by privates. Now, the writer goes on to say, in the same way, the common, ordinary, one-talent Christians are the backbone of the church. We have our great evangelists, our super congregations, led by dynamic elders and our wealthy brethren who are able to finance great works. But if the work of the Lord is to be done, if the gospel is to be taken to the lost, it will be the ordinary Christians who do it. You have been gifted for a reason. You have a part to play in the ministry of the work today. You're not here just for what's in it for me. You're here as we looked in the opening part of chapter two, what's in it for others? How can I minister to, to someone else? We need to focus on others today. The second thing we notice about the life of Epaphroditus, not only did he have a balanced life, but uh, number two in your notes is he had a burdened life. Note he came as a messenger to minister to Paul and to Paul's need. Why did he come? He came because the church in Philippi and Epaphroditus as part of that church were deeply burdened for what was going on in the life of Paul. Paul was a prisoner. He was possibly facing execution. Uh, prisoners in those days did not have it the same as prisoners today. He, you were hardly given enough food to, to live on, let alone to survive. Uh, you depended on people to come and, and bring what it was that you needed while you were in prison there. And so Epaphroditus risked his life, faced some dangerous traveling conditions, went on a ministry that wasn't a popular ministry in those days. It wasn't popular to support a political prisoner. We have our political games that we play today, and a lot of people enjoy that, but uh, it wasn't a game for Epaphroditus. He could be arrested for helping the Apostle Paul. He, he could be identified with him and, and put in prison him, himself there. But he was so burdened for Paul and his ministry that he went. And then in the process, he got sick. And News reached Philippi that he was sick. They were concerned about him. And so again, Epaphroditus, it's in verse 26, was burdened or distressed because they had heard that he was sick. He had a, he had a concern 
for others. And he didn't want to be a burden to somebody else. Interesting sideline here. I don't know if I, you know, I've got time to go off on a rabbit trail. <laughs> yeah. did, did you notice that he must have been sick for a considerable length of time? Because news had to travel from Rome to Philippi, from Philippi back to Rome again. And here is the Apostle Paul at many times exercising the gift of healing for others. Why didn't he do it for Epaphroditus? I have a feeling that he probably prayed for Epaphroditus. He probably asked the Lord to heal. But, you know, sometimes we get hung up on the health welfare gospel and we think God owes us a living. That God has to do it our way. Here was Epaphroditus and God said, guess what? You're going to go through this sickness for a time. Now, the Lord eventually answered that prayer, and he was restored to health. But uh, I, I've had people come to me and say, you know, you can't be spiritual if, if you're sick or if you don't have enough money or so forth. Uh, I'd like them to talk to Epaphroditus and, and uh, see, see what Epaphroditus has to say about that. But in his concern, in his burden here, he demonstrated the principles of verses 2 and 3 here where he said, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Don't merely look out for your own interests, but also the interests of others. He didn't adopt a poor me attitude. Look at what I have to go through. Look at what I'm struggling with. He was concerned for the other person. He, he was demonstrating the character of Christ to them. And because of that, I think he also had uh, your third one in your notes, a, a blessed life here in verses 28 and 29. Paul chooses to honor him, and he asked the church to honor him as well. They were to hold him in high esteem here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, it says, We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We are to esteem very highly those who serve. No matter what the capacity may be, we are to honor them because God is using them in a special way. Too often what we do if we're not careful, is we criticize one another. You know, there's one gift I have not found in Scripture. That's the gift of criticism. I know some people that love to exercise that gift. That They can always find fault with what someone else is doing, but I don't find it in Scripture. If someone is serving, we have a responsibility to encourage them, to let them know that we appreciate that God is working in them and, and through them today. Sometimes in our criticism, we forget the sacrifice that someone else is making. We forget the, the commitment of time or, or of effort that they have to put into to their service. We are all called to be examples of Jesus Christ to the church and to the world in which we find ourselves. If we want to have a blessed life, we need to learn to appreciate each and every one that has a part in the work of the Lord in our church. Notice Epaphroditus used or, or risked his life for, for the sake of the church in verse 30. That word risk is only used here in Scripture. The only time you're going to find it in Scripture, it's, it's a gambling term. And uh, he's not necessarily supporting gambling. But literally what he is saying is, here was a man who considered the odds and took a great risk, knowing that it might cost him his life. He, he considered the odds and he was going to be faithful to God. Why would he do that? He did it because he believed that God was able to take his life and somehow use it to communicate the gospel to someone else. What would 
you do if God asked you to take a risk today? Would you in faith believe that he's able to work in your life and work through you? Sometimes he asks us to do things that we just don't have any idea how it's going to work out. Are we willing to do it anyhow? I, I was thinking of that as, as uh, I, I hate, hate to use you, Brett, for an example, but you gave me the perfect example. Uh, stumbling over a German word. How many times has that happened in Austria? Hmm. Yeah, It's a risk, isn't it? You, you, you're embarrassed when you do that. Uh, uh, you almost feel like a child again, don't you, sometimes? Are we willing to take those kind of risks if it means somebody else will come to Jesus Christ? If somehow we can impact their lives, are, are we willing to take that risk today? When we know there's a cost involved, maybe it's going to cost us some time or effort or even maybe some finances. Are we willing to say, Lord, if that's what you're asking, I believe that somehow you're going to work it out for good in my life and I'll take the risk for Jesus Christ. That may be something simple like walking across the street and knocking on your neighbor's door, seeking to share Christ with them. It may be inviting someone to your home for a cup of coffee and praying that God would open up the opportunity for you to have an impact in their lives. It may be expressed in 101 ways because each of us have different gifts and different opportunities. Are we willing to take the risk when God asks us to do something? We're each called to serve. We each have a part to play in building the church of Jesus Christ. How are we doing in that area? You might say, well, my, my gift isn't that great. Remember, it's faithfulness that God is looking for. I, I, I like the story of a, a little boy that was on the beach. He, it was, the sun had come up. There were hundreds of starfish on the beach that were gonna die because of the sun. This little boy was busy saving starfish. Now that doesn't seem very important to us, but that, that's what he, he, he would pick up a starfish throw it back in the ocean, turn around, get another one. And, and a passerby came on by and said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm saving their lives. The man said, forget it. There's too many of them. You can't make a, a difference. You can't possibly save them all. The little boy said, I can't save them all, but it sure makes a difference to this one, as he put it in the ocean. We can't reach everybody in the world, but we can make a difference in somebody's life. We, we can be used to the glory of Jesus Christ. We need to learn to be faithful and leave the results in God's hands. There was a woman that had to do that. Her name was Charlotte Elliott. How many of you know who Charlotte Elliott was? Nobody does. Nope. Lived long before Jim Elliott did. Uh, no idea. Okay, I'm going to tell you who she was. She was the one that wrote one of the greatest evangelistic hymns of all times. She wrote, Just As I Am. How many of you know Just As I Am? How many of you have sung it over and over again? How many of you have been in evangelistic meetings where it was sung? And yet you never knew who she was. I didn't either till I looked in my book of illustrations there. But you need to understand a little bit about Charlotte. She was an invalid from her youth. She deeply resented the constraints her handicap placed on her activities. In an emotional outburst on one occasion, she expressed those feelings to a visiting minister, Dr. Milan. He listened. He was touched by her distress, but he insisted that her problems should not divert her attention from what she needed most to hear. He challenged her to turn her life over to God, to come to him just as she was with all of her anger and bitterness. She resented what seemed to be an almost callous attitude on his part, 
but God spoke to her heart through his words, and she committed her life to the Lord. Each year on the anniversary of that decision, Dr. Ma Malon wrote Charlotte a letter encouraging her to continue to be strong in the faith, but even as a Christian, she had doubts and struggles. One particularly sore point was her inability to effectively get out and serve the Lord. She even at times resented her brother. Her brother was a, a pastor. She resented his successful preaching and evangelistic ministry. She longed to be used of God herself, but felt that her health and physical condition prevented it. Then in 1836, on the 14th anniversary of her conversion, while she was alone in the evening, the 47-year-old Charlotte Elliott wrote her spiritual biography in verse. Here in a prayer of confession, she poured out her feelings to God. The third stanza, perhaps more than any others, describes her own pilgrimage. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. How many of you sung that over and over again? Didn't know the background of it, did we? Many years later, when reflecting on the impact of his sister, that his sister made in penning this one hymn, Reverend Elliot said, in the course of a long ministry, I hope that I have been permitted to see some fruit of my labor, but I feel far more has been done by a single hymn of my sister's, just as I am. Here was a woman that felt she couldn't accomplish much for the Lord. And yet her life still speaks volumes today, each time that song is used and, and sung in evangelistic ministries. As we think of our call today to ministry, your gift, your service matters to God. Your gift may be, not be noticed by somebody else or anyone else in the church as far as that is concerned. But God, in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. God will reward you for your faithfulness. You will stand beside, as we were singing, those heroes of the faith. And if you are faithful in the gift that he has given to you, you will stand as one of those heroes of the faith. What are we willing to risk for the sake of the gospel? What part are we willing to play in reaching our community for Jesus Christ? Are we willing to use our gift, no matter what it is, to the glory of Jesus Christ. Are we willing to pray, Lord, here I am today. Use me this week in whatever way you choose to touch a heart and touch a life for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are all called to be fellow servants in the outreach of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our society. How, and how we express that and where we do is in your hands, not ours. Give us the wisdom and the courage to be faithful in whatever it is you're asking us to do today so that you may be glorified and help us, Father, to realize our reward's not in this life, it's in the next. And may we continue to serve even though we may face criticism and opposition at times, help us to realize we're serving you to the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.